OK, I make that six o'clock now. So um, welcome to tonight's meeting of Burston Hamble and Hound Local Area Committee, which is being broadcast and recorded via Microsoft Teams Live. My name is Councillor Tonya Craig and I'm chair of this committee and will be conducting the meeting tonight. During the meeting, you'll hear from members of the committee who are on the screen now. Also present are the officers from Eastley Borough Council who are now shown on the screen. They will present their reports that have been written and provided and provide support for the committee tonight. If we experience a connection problem, this event will be paused. If a councillor loses connection or joins later, I will ask them to introduce or reintroduce themselves for the benefit of the viewers. In the unlikely event of myself losing connection, it's not too unlikely, unfortunately, uh, the vice chair, councillor Steve Holes, will take over. We always welcome people to speak at the meeting, although this is a formal meeting of Eastleigh Borough Council and not a public meeting. Public participation during this virtual committee will be undertaken in a slightly different way. The members of the public are registered to speak will be invited to the live event at the relevant time and will be given a total of three minutes to speak. A verbal 30 second advance warning will be provided by the local area manager. People wishing to speak on an item on the agenda are able to do so before the debate starts. Once the debate has started, however, it is not possible to invite or receive comments from the floor. OK, that said, this is the first meeting, live meeting of um, BHH. We've had a, a couple of um, other meetings, so um, bear with us, please, as we go through this meeting. Um, hopefully everything will go smoothly. OK, apologies. Laura, I don't think there are any apologies because we're all here. No, there are no apologies. Thank you very much. Declarations of interest. Any members have any declarations of interest? No, everybody's shaking their head, um, so there are no declarations. If something comes up later in the meeting, um, feel free to uh, draw my attention to it then. OK, moving on to Chair's announcements. Um, I want to start by welcoming um, Julie Williams. She's taken over from Matt Blythe. She's our local area manager now. So welcome, Julie. Um, it's been a, a bit of a, a start for you. Um, but uh, you've now met the team and the team have met you, even though it's just through a screen. But uh, hopefully we'll we'll get uh, to meet you all properly um, and look forward to meeting, uh, working with you. So welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to just thank our staff um, for the unprecedented times, but the, the work they're doing goes above and beyond um, their day jobs and they continue to do their day jobs um, alongside that so I wanted to thank all our staff they've been absolutely brilliant um, and I'd like to, to thank our community as well our community have really stepped up there's a brilliant spirit out there um, people shopping for neighbours um, picking up prescriptions all sorts of things and it's the little things that are making a big difference to those that can't get out so I'd like to thank all the community hopefully this has started something that will continue after Covid's uh, gone um, but uh, I look forward to, to that community spirit continuing. Um, just one last thing on Chair's announcements. Um, at the last meeting back in December, we had Mr Doe who came and spoke in public participation. Um, quite an upset chap, bless him. Um, but I've spoken to the family. Um, you will remember comments that were made at that meeting. Um, the family wrote to me um, on an email and I've met with one of the sons as well. Um, who just wanted to put it on record that um, the family are quite happy with the way things went um, with the sale of their, their land um, and have said that the, the council and us members have been so supportive that they wanted that on record. So I just thought I'd, I'd add that now. Um, so that's it for Chair's announcements. Um, Laura, I don't have anybody in public participation, is that correct? That is correct, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to minutes of the previous meeting. Um, does anybody have any questions, queries, anything they'd like to change as a true record or, or can I have a proposer, please? David? I'll second that. Sorry, I didn't have a proposer. I thought to Steve was um, proposing it, but oh. I'll, I'll second it. 
OK, so that's Steve Holes proposed and David seconded. Um, all those in favour accepting that is a true record. Yep. That's yes, please. Every, right, so everybody's in agreement. OK, thank you very much. We'll move on to um, appointments to outside bodies, regulatory and other panels. Um, Julie, did you want to introduce this report, please? Yes, yes, certainly. And thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this is a report that we do annually and it's the appointments to regulatory panels, other groups and outside bodies. And it is recommended that the nominations for 2021 municipal year appointments to regulatory panels and other groups as set out in paragraph five are approved and the proposed nominations for the 2021 municipal year appointments to outside bodies as set out in Appendix A are also approved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Julie. Um, there is one um, change on there, though. Um, David, you were on one of the panels. Yes, indeed. Um, I was on the um, Hamble Community um, School um, oh, <laughs> uh, Community Management Committee, and um, I retired from that last year and was uh, replaced by Adam. So. OK, thank you very much. Um, we have a grant up on the screen at the moment. I don't think that we um, we needed that at the moment. Oh, it's sorry. Already... Me. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <That's... laughs> oh, I'm the mayor. Sorry. That's OK. It was it. Right. So, Adam, you went on to that one last year and it just it wasn't updated um, for some reason. But is everybody happy with those? Um, those papers, everybody's yes. happy with the committees they're on. That's Jane. Jane. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say um, we did ha say something about, um, as in it's these strange times, um, so, you know, I, I'm shielding at the moment. And so um, you, we were going to discuss having um, substitutions if somebody yes. can't go to a meeting. Yeah, we were, we were going to add on all of those um, that we have a a person for those panels, but um, we wanted a, a line put in that if anybody can't attend those meetings for whatever reason, we can send a, a named substitute in advance of the meeting taking place. Because we have to have somebody um, allotted to the different panels, you're the one that gets um, told of those meetings when they're going to happen. Mm. If you can't attend, then you need to find a substitute and let the panel know who you're going to be sending in your place. So wow. we just wanted, um, you know, something on every one of those to say that anyone could be a substitute from from us six members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So can I have a proposer, please? Happy to propose that. Right, so that's David proposing. And was that seconded by Steve? Yes, it was, Chair. Brilliant. All those in favour? Yes, please. That's yeah. Everybody. Um, OK, I think we need to do a roll call on those ones. Sorry, Laura, did you need to do a roll call on those? Yes, please, Chair, sorry. Yep. Um, so as I call your name, councillors, please, can you just let me know if you're in favour or not? So Councillor Airy? Yes, I'm, I'm supporting it. Councillor Craig? Yes. Councillor Cross? Yes. Councillor Holes? Yes. Councillor Manning? Yes. Councillor Rich? Yes. Thank you very much, Chair. That's unanimous. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much, Laura. OK, we'll move straight on to the financial management report. Um, and again, I'll ask Julie to introduce this report, please. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for that. I got ahead of myself. That's OK. <laughs> so this is the uh, this is the financial uh, management report for BHH and the recommendations are as follows. 12,500 is allocated towards the air quality strategy in Bursledon, Hamble, Lahound and uh, Hamble, Le Rice and Hound funded from developers contributions. The £4,925 is allocated for enhancements to the Bursledon station car park funded by developers contributions. £3,095 is allocated for, for repair to the rail trail in Hamble, funded by existing revenue budget. £1,080 is allocated for new bins in Hamble Square, funded by existing revenue budget. 
£210 is allocated for replacement Dragon's Teeth at Benbridge, funded from existing revenue budget. £360 is, is allocated for a replacement bin in Cunningham, Cunningham Gardens, funded from existing revenue budget. £965 is allocated from the Community Grants Revenue Budget to Growfest £300 and to Hamble Parish Council for two separate grants. Uh, one, is for, um, uh, one is for the Scramble Nets for £500 and the other for Speed Awareness Signs. OK, thank you very much for that, Julie. Are there any comments or questions from um, members at all? Yes. Please. Oh, right. OK, yeah, I've got David, please. Uh, OK, um, <clears throat> just a couple of things. First of all, I'm pleased to see that we're starting to put some money towards the air quality action plan. That's really important. Um, that, 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 that now is we've got that in place across the borough. Um, we've extended at the air quality action uh, management plan for our own area by including Providence Hill area of Bursledon along with um, parts of Hamble Lane. And um, we now need to start f funding some of the actions um, in the action plan to get things underway. So this uh, money from developer contributions is a good start to that. And of course, we should be looking to see how we can uh, allocate funding in future towards um, that action plan, because it's really important that goes ahead, despite the fact that at the present time there is a reduction in um, uh, motor traffic on most roads and therefore air quality has improved temporarily. It will all come back, I'm sure, in, in the fullness of time. And so uh, we need to be well prepared for that. The second thing I was going to mention was the Burleson Station car park, because we got, <clears throat> I've had some um, really good uh, feedback on that from the um, <coughs> Community Rail Partnership and also from the Friends of Burleson Station. Thank you, David. Um, Steve, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. I wanted to just raise the fact that the Burzelen Station car park was actually completed at the beginning of lockdown. Um, special um, powers, um, delegated powers were uh, invoked so that that work could go ahead early prior to this um, meeting because the car parks were very empty at that time and the work was actually done in less than two days. And uh, as David says, we've had a lot of good comments about it. So I just wanted to thank staff involved for getting that work done. Yeah, it's, it's worth actually mentioning, Steve and David, thank you for those. It's worth actually mentioning that um, some of these grants should have come to um, the last um, local area committee that was postponed in March. Um, we were due a meeting um, the day that we were we were told to close down, actually. So uh, that that meeting was cancelled. So because we had actually already agreed that funding, um, some of the work has already been done, um, as people are, are hearing. And Cunningham Gardens, they had a replacement bin um, on this agenda that is in place as well. And I've had some really good feedback from um, members of the public thanking us that they haven't got to walk um, a fair distance to, to the nearest bin. So um, that's been really well received as well. Any of the members wanting to speak on this at all? Malcolm. Oh yeah, um, it's the Hamble Power 665 pain. Well, there's a breakdown between the scramble nets and the signs. I just got a lump sum. I just wanted a breakdown for the scramble net and the traffic signs, please. Just before we ask Julie to answer that, can I just mention that um, with the road signs, we're we're going to hold those grant that that grant for the road signs at the moment. Um, we've been told from legal department that the um, the police there's something there's something legal that people are speeding with those signs um, that we can't use the ones that Hamble Parish have proposed. There is a police recognised one that they are happy for people to use, but until we get the agreement from Hamble Parish that they want to use the other one. We can't allocate the money for it. So the money is there and will be held by us until such time we have confirmation from the parish that they will use the police designed ones. So Julie, do you want to just give that breakdown, please? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, 
Yeah, the breakdown is um, £500 for scramble nets and £165 towards the speed awareness signs. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, no other questions then. Can I have a proposer for that report, please? Our proposed chair, Councillor Holes. <laughs> that was that was Jane Malcolm, uh, Jane Adam and David all together. Yeah. <laughs> Can we take Jane as second in that yeah. one, please? OK, everybody in favour. We need to do a roll call again. Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> Councillor Airy. Yes. Councillor Craig. Yes. Councillor Cross. Yes. Councillor Holes. Yes. Councillor Manning. Yes. Councillor Rich. Yes. That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, can I just, um, for, for anybody listening or um, will be watching this later, um, the financial report is um, or will be online. Um, it's online in the agenda. Um, I think the live box was on myself um, whilst that report came up. So members that are members of the public um, that wanted to actually look at that can look at that online if they didn't see it properly. OK, moving on to presentation of planning guidelines. Um, Andy, you're coming to join us for this one. Andy Granfield, please. Hi, Chair. It's going to be presented as a pre recorded uh, presentation. OK, thank you. In this short presentation, I would like to briefly run through some key points in relation to the planning process to assist councillors in determining the planning applications on the agenda tonight. The starting point for determining any planning application is that a proposal can only be considered on planning grounds and must be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. At present, the development plan for Eastleigh Borough Council comprises the saved policies of the 2001 to 2011 adopted local plan and, where applicable, the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan. The committee report for each application will refer to the Minerals and Waste Plan if it is relevant to that application. The Council has prepared a replacement for the adopted local plan, which covers the period of 2016 to 2036. This plan has been through the examination process and the inspector's post hearing advice was received in April. Where there are specific policies relevant to a site, the committee report provides an indication of the weight that may be given to those policies. The report will also advise on the weight to be given to the submitted local plan in general. Other documents that may be of relevance include supplementary planning documents or SPDs which are adopted by the Council and provide more detailed guidance on specific matters. Guidance and policy published by government is also relevant. In particular, the National Planning Policy Framework or the NPPF is a significant material planning consideration. The NPPF sets out key planning requirements seeking to ensure that planning decisions deliver sustainable development. The guidance recognises that there are different components to sustainability which interlink. For applications proposing larger scale development, the committee report will cover each of these three strands separately. Other material considerations that may be relevant to an application can include, for example, the planning history, both on a site or nearby, appeal decisions made by the planning inspectorate, and case law where decisions have been taken through the courts. Site specific matters such as residential amenity, infrastructure and ecology are also significant considerations. There are some matters that are frequently raised that cannot be considered within the planning process. These include devaluation of property, civil matters such as boundary disputes and matters that are covered by other legislation. As councillors are aware, there are a number of different types of planning applications which can be identified by the letter prefix in the planning reference. Of these, a local area committee will typically deal with three types of applications. 
These are full outline and reserve matters applications. Full applications have all the detailed information necessary to determine whether a proposal is acceptable, submitted in a single application as a one step process. A two stage process allows for outline and reserve matters applications to be submitted. The outline application seeks to provide sufficient information to determine whether the principle of development is acceptable and may potentially include some detailed matters. This is then followed by a reserved matters application or multiple applications at a later date to deal with the details not approved at outline. Typically, where planning permission is granted, conditions are imposed, which may require further information to be submitted or may require certain details or measures set out in the documents supporting the application to be complied with. Where more information is needed, one or more discharge of condition applications will be submitted to the local planning authority. Where conditions are imposed, they must meet the six tests set out in legislation. This concludes the planning guidelines presentation. Thank you for your attention. That felt like having Kitty with us then. Um, right, OK, we've only got one planning application on this evening, so I will now call on Andy Granfield to uh, to present that one, please. Sorry, Chair, before you do, can I just remind all councillors that you must be in the room for the entirety of this presentation in order to get, be able to vote on this item, including all the speakers? Just as I know you know this, but just as a reminder for virtual meetings, we have to be really clear and I will ask you to confirm again before we vote. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Laura, I missed that one. OK, Andy. Thank you, Chair. I'm Andy Granfield. I head up the housing and development team and I'm going to present the application tonight before members. I'll share my screen so we can take you through the plans. If you could tell me, please, when you can see that on the screen, that'd be great. It's this, on. this is an application for extensions at Crowsport, 14A Crowsport comprising of a first floor extension, roof terrace and side extensions <clears throat> with some alterations to the fenestr fenestration. On the screen, we have the site outlined in red and it is on the <clears throat> eastern side of this entrance into Crows Port Estate, where the topography falls from Satchel Lane down towards the river. Uh, the site itself falls within the Hamble Conservation Area and also within the Crowsport Special Policy Area. Uh, both of those have policies within our adopted and emerging local plan, which seek to protect both the character of the conservation area as well as the special characteristics of the Crowsport Estate. And I will move on to those in a little bit more detail when we look at the plans. This is the, the current site with the unadopted estate road here, dropping into the existing drive. There's a drop of about a metre into this site. And on this side, we've got the existing property, which has a lower ground floor level, which comprises of garages and workshops and an upper ground floor level, which comprises of the habitable accommodation. Uh, around the outside, there's various areas of garden and open space, and it's a fairly open frontage here with a chain link fence, but quite a dense hedge in predominantly along this side here. The ground, as I've mentioned, does drop into this site from the property on the south, which is 30 Satchel Lane, and then it drops further down then into number um, 14 to the north. To provide some context to that, we've got the, the plans on the screen. If we look at the bottom plan, first of all, this is the view from the estate road. So the building appears single storey in this location, but actually that is above a underground or subterranean level in this location here, which from this particular angle isn't particularly visible. However, we can see from the top picture how that it comprises of the lower ground floor level here set at below ground level. 
with the plans, they are 2D, so we have these 3D isometric drawings to sort of convey the uh, proportions of the building. And I think in this particular instance, it's really helpful with the, the topography, which drops from the right down to the left here. And we can see the main building in this location with some alien features added. And one of the unique characteristics of the Crowsport Estate is its Art Deco design. Uh, introduced in the 1930s into this area, which comprises of white buildings, simple windows and parapet walls around the top of buildings. There are some additions to this property with this uh, conservatory, a, a first floor hanging area, which is supported on stilts, as well as another conservatory on this side of the property here. And th this particular building didn't form part of the original buildings that were built on this site, uh, but followed in the style of those at a later date. This plan does also show number 14, which has recently had extensions added uh, and improvements, which is reflective of the character and a number of the other properties within the state have also been amended. Some photos of the existing building, looking straight on from uh, the, the main access road, and the bottom picture shows the, the just the underside of the, the lower ground floor level and the car parking in front of it. Running through the pictures on the screen at the moment, the top left picture is showing the eastern side of the building with these windows serving the, the workshop and garage area, habitable rooms at the first floor in this location or the upper ground floor. In more detail in terms of the, the northern elevation with a bin store and garage workshop entrance in this location. And then the bottom left picture is stood looking back up the hill towards the application site in here with number 14 on the left hand side. And finally, the bottom right picture is looking from uh, the entrance into Crowsport with the application site tucked in this location here. So what I've tried to do is to put plans together comparing the, the proposed against the existing. So I think this will help translate what's, what is before members. So the, the existing is on the left, the proposed is on the right. So in this instance, the access remains in the same location, but a reconfiguration to the car parking. Uh, there is where we've got the, the projecting and the, the hanging first floor area, which is on stilts. That is to be enclosed in this location with a with a, a, a wall and there's a slight revision for the removal of on the left hand plan a small porch area here which becomes encompassed into the floor space and a porch added here with a new walkway proposed over a pond and the replacement of the conservatory to the south of the building with a uh, solid built structure there's also some alterations to the boundaries uh, to suit. So looking at it in a little bit more detail, we can see that the, the ground floor is very similar in size to that which exists at the moment. The right hand picture being the, the proposed lower ground floor consisting of garage office, garage workshops and a, a gymnasium. Moving on to the upper ground floor, Again, very similar, similar in terms of floor space uh, with the removal of this alien feature on the building and replace with a, a extension to, in keeping with the existing property. And as I mentioned, the addition of a porch in this location and the removal of the conservatory here. And so actually the design approach does follow the, the, the theme of the Art Deco style and for the, on that basis does have the support of, of the heritage officer. It's a very modest increase in floor space at, at this level with about uh, 25 square metres in total across the, the lower and the upper ground floor as being additions to, to what we have before us at the moment. The bulk of the additions fall at this first floor level, which is where the main habitable area would be, and it's the plans have been revised uh, with this area repositioned uh, and this comprises of about 40 to 42 percent of the total footprint of the building and that's actually quite an important feature because in seeking to maintain some of the original characteristics of 
the Crows Port Estate and acknowledging that there have been a number of other properties which have had first floor extensions. The council have sought to reduce any first floor extensions to about 50% or no more than 50% of the existing footprint of a building and that's to reflect its original designs as as a bungalow um, but that that has actually been diluted significantly over the last 70 years with various extensions added to buildings so looking at the top picture which is the existing elevation from the estate and the bottom picture which is the proposals we can see that the the first floor sits in this location with the alien features of the conservatory removed and this extension moved out in a, in a northerly direction. So it still has a, an appearance of a, a single and a two storey building. And this shows it in context with the properties on, on either side. So to the right hand side we have Satchel Lane, which is uh, Whilst it faces Satchel Lane is within the Crowsport Special Policy Area and its design is reflective of the, the single storey nature of the buildings within Crowsport. This does have an extant planning permission to add a first floor above the property, uh, which could be implemented, but has yet to be. And we see on the left hand side the number 14, which has also been, been extended. The bottom elevation shows the views from number 30 or from the south looking towards the building uh, with a long strip window in this location which would be obscure glazed. There are roof terraces within this property and to protect the privacy of the adjoining properties on top of the balustrades on top um, yes, top of the balustrades, we have also got the, oh, sorry, the parapet walls. We have also got some glazing so that there would be no direct overlooking into the adjoining properties, which is number seven, number 28 and number 30. Now this elevation here is, is looking sort of the bottom one is looking from the north towards it, which gives the feeling of a, very much of a three storey building with this lower ground floor very much in, in view. The realities are that this is very well screened when viewed from public areas with the real only view of this being from the estate road itself. So actually this is it's quite a misleading plan in terms of the scale of the building on a flat 2D drawing. The top plan is the eastern elevation looking towards number seven Crowsport and we do start to get a feeling here of the the first floor element if this is the upper ground floor being offset but this is where the plans really do come to life and showing how they they look in terms of the existing and proposed and if we look at the right hand picture we can see the first floor element which comprises of about um, 60 to 65 square meters i believe in in this location uh, is set back from what would be viewed as single story on either side um, and is set back from this lower ground floor area. So when viewed from a public vantage point, it does maintain the proportions of many of the other properties within the, the Crowsport estate. In terms of the report members, you've got a very detailed uh, report which sets out how this application has been considered. Uh, we have received some amended plans which did some minor changes clarifying the boundary. Uh, and the height of neighbouring properties and condition one would need to be amended to reflect those changes in terms of the drawing numbers. So in terms of the key issues here, we've, we've got an estate which is of a unique characteristic uh, and it falls in a conservation area and our policies seek to protect and preserve those characteristics. There have been mitigation measures included within this scheme to, to protect the amenity of neighbouring properties with the, uh, the, the um, screening and the obscure glazing uh, and we're comfortable that the development does protect that privacy both in terms of overlooking but also in terms of any overshadowing or visual dominance. The, the extension is set sufficiently far away from neighbouring properties not to be deemed visually intrusive. The style of the building does very much reflect the characteristics of Crowsport despite its large scale and the, the design in terms of the materials, uh, the simplicity of it uh, and the, the parapets which run around the roof all mirror the original Art Deco design and we, as I mentioned previously we do have the support of our heritage officer to this building. Uh, there's adequate parking on site to meet a building of this nature uh, and it does comply with the parking policies. 
So in conclusion, whilst this is a large development, it is deemed to, to meet the requirements of both national and local planning policy, and it does meet the criteria for Hamble Conservation Area and the Crowsford Estates, and therefore a recommendation is to approve. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy. Um, we'll move on to um, objectors before the supporters. Um, I'm going to ask Julie to come in and speak um, We've had, I believe, two written statements um, come in, which I'll ask Julie to, to read out in a second. But can I just ask um, Brenda Thompson and Carol Gold just to be on standby for when um, Julie's finished? So Julie, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So the, the first uh, objection is from Beverly Ollier, and she says, I'm writing to object to the proposed erection of the second floor extension of 14A Crow Sport. There are two reasons for this objection which centre on the following concerns. Number one, external design, layout or appearance. And number two, impact on conservation area. Objection one, the external windows on the proposed upper floor or second floor west elevation will cause significant overlooking issues and loss of privacy. Both windows are angled to directly overlook our main seating area in the garden, our garden, our lounge, upstairs main bedroom and balcony. Objection two, the impact on the Crowsport conservation area of approving a three storey development will set a precedent for other properties in Crowsport to utilise. For example, number seven, which sits directly in front of my property, number 28, could do exactly the same. The proposed dwelling is overdeveloped compared with the size of the plot and relative to other dwellings within the conservation area. Specifically, reference one, policy 3169 LB, appendix B states, the mass materials and forms of the building and associated landscape features are in scale and harmony with the existing and adjoining buildings and the area as a whole and the proportion of its parts relate well to each other to the existing buildings and to the adjoining buildings. I formally request that you take the above objections into consideration when deciding on the applications. So that's the first objection and this is the second written one and this is from Mr Paul Gilvey. The property at 14A Crow Sport is currently two, two metres higher than our property. Adding a third level will take it over by another four metres. This will completely overshadow our property, taking away entirely our privacy and enjoyment of our profit property. It will also block sunlight from the garden, particularly in the spring and winter months when the sun is lower in the sky. Further, it will set a precedence within Crow Sport for properties to have a third level. All our previous comments, particularly those relating to proximity noise generated from the proposed roof entertaining area and being overlooked as per the original and amended applications, still stand. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Julie. Um, I think we've got Brenda Thompson next, but can I make a correction? It's actually Ian Gold. I had Carol written down, but it's Ian. So if we can ask Brenda, if you're ready, welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Brenda Thompson. I live at 30 Satchel Lane, also known as Four Crowsport. It's an original, currently single storey Crowsport house uh, with a roof terrace. I have planning permission to add a first floor extension. 14A is straight in front of me down the hill, and I'm objecting to this unpopular proposal for a three storey house. The scale and mass and height are inappropriate for the Crowsport Conservation Area, which we entered into in 2008, and it also fails the Local Plan Directives Policy 59BE and DM1. Paragraph 1 covers mass and scale. A three-storey house in that, on that site would completely dominate the Crowsport Estate, and everyone would then want three floors and should get it. Crowsport houses are either single storey with a roof terrace or two floors with balconies. 14A is an infill property built on the old tennis court with two floors at the time of building. It's on a slope and it has currently got 270 square metres. That's the equivalent of three three bed semis and only two people live there. Beverly mentioned number seven, they applied for a, an additional floor back, I think it was 2005. Despite going to appeal, it was refused. Paragraph one also covers the relationship to adjoining buildings, their spaces and views 
loss of outlook and overlooking. Quality Places talks about back-to-back -back buildings, minimum of 20 metres apart. The contextual building plans look like we all have huge gardens, but that's not the case. 14A and number 30 are at angles to each other, and the visual impact could not be worse. The back of my house faces the side of their house. The houses are in close proximity, only 9.5 metres apart. The plan shows a finished height of 19 metres, the same as number 28 and number 5, but those houses are on Satchel Lane, not halfway down the hill where number 14 is. My house is currently only 3.5 metres high, and that includes the parapet, and it would be completely dominated by a three-storey 19-metre building directly in front, looming high over the entire length of the hedge, overlooking the conservatory, really. living room and main bedroom, all of which face the back garden and are currently private. My residential amenity would be severely affected. 14A was finally, 14A was bought through Brambles as a large two storey house with, quote, the potential to create more living space to the ground floor subject to planning. The house also benefits from a roof terrace with river views. You may remember just how hard the Lake Joy Hadfield fought to keep that view not that long ago. So no expectation of a third story was ever created and in my view, nor should it be allowed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Brenda. OK, are we ready for Ian now, please? Good evening, Chair. Good evening. Ian, Ian Gould, uh, number six, Crowsport. Um, our objections, um, in summary, uh, are that we believe that it is a two storey property at present. Um, uh, that this planning application will in fact turn it into a three storey property. We think it will create a, uh, a, a precedent uh, which is inconsistent with the existing development um, of, of Crowsport and pave the way to damaging architecture on the estate. The west and front elevation of the, of the uh, proposed extension would overlook our property, uh, which the fenestration is primarily glass and would look straight into our internal, the internals of our accommodation. And um, it would deprive us of privacy. The proposed roof terrace, terrace would enable a direct line of sight to the internals of our property and accommodation through the front elevation which I've just mentioned is glass. There is also the potential of noise pollution from the, the external deck on the third floor. I'd like to just comment on the um, the report prepared by Mr Dyer, um, where he's, he says that uh, there's been various add-ons to um, uh, number 14A. In fact, there certainly haven't been in the last 30 years. Um, and the last the last owners lived there for 30 years. Um, they also he also comments that there have this alien features about uh, various other properties on the estate in connection with pitched roofs, one of which is our, our property. But it, I'd like to point out that our property was built in 1946 with a pitched roof. It's not been added since. Um, we feel in summary, there will be a loss of, of, of skyline, an impact on the morning sun in the winter. And uh, in that case, we would we, we think that it would be detrimental to the architectural integrity of the estate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ian. OK, that's the only two that I've um, got for, for, for um, listed for speaking. Is that correct, Laura? No, we have um, Mr. Adi Paplampu. Apologies if I've not said that right. In support. Yeah, that's in support. Oh, sorry. Yeah, in objection. objection. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. OK, so that's the objections done. Um, so, yes, we have one, um, as you say, for um, supporting, and it's Adi Papulampu. Hopefully, we got that right. We probably haven't, but apologies if we haven't. 
Uh, yes, good afternoon, Chair, and good afternoon, panel. Um, my name's Adi Puklampu. I'm, I represent Tollfield Architects, who prepared the application before you today. Um, and I'll just quickly read through my statement, which addresses some of the concerns that have been raised. Uh, this householder's planning application is for a remodeled detached three bedroom Art Deco style bungalow, which seeks approval for the erection of a new first floor extension served by roof terrace and includes alterations to the property's site landscaping and car parking layout generally. As existing, the property is provided with living accommodation located entirely at the upper ground floor, but has a large, completely separate, uninhabitable double garage and workshop on the lower ground floor. Collectively, the alterations proposed have been designed in accordance with the local planning policy and the Crowsport Estate Conservation Local Plan. In terms of the existing topography and scale of the Crowsport Estate properties, these tier in a northeasterly north direction down towards the River Hamble and collectively reflect an arrangement of simple white box dwellings. Many of the original dwellings have been converted or rebuilt into two story houses over the years, which include first floor living accommodation that benefits from views towards the River Hamble. Given the existing property's unique position at the brow of the hillside, these were the key principles introduced and followed within this application's design, whereby the architectural form, mass and height have been tailored to coincide with that of the estate, but specifically are designed to relate with the scale, mass, height and form of number five Crowsport estate opposite at the estate entrance and number 14 Crowsport estate adjacent just down the hill. In terms of objections from local residents associated with scale overlooking or perceived impact of the proposal on any existing amenities, this application has been carefully tailored to remove or limit these concerns. During the planning process, the new first floor has been partially reconfigured to reduce possible impacts or potential views towards adjacent properties, specifically concerns associated with number 30 satchel lane to the rear of 14 Crowsport. Furthermore, the proposal also includes the introduction of mitigation measures measures such as obscure glazed windows and parapet wall screening on the eastern and southern side of the property or by pulling back sections of the parapet wall to limit access to the building's roof terrace edge. With regards to number 30 Satchel Lane and as per the planners report, the department have recognised that the increased height of the new habitable first floor will not be overbearing on this property and will not impact on... 30 the seconds remaining. The <clears throat> The officers assessing the proposal have recommended this application for approval and adopted the view that whilst accommodation at the second floor at the second floor level may not be acceptable on other properties, each case has to be considered on its own merits. And in this instance, due to the topography of the site for the design approach taken. Um, during the planning process, it was also recognised that building alterations have been sensitively, sensitively designed to allow the proposal to appear as a step two storey structure rather than as a full three-storey building relative to the Crowsport estate. In conclusion, the planning department have accepted that the latest changes have been helped to have helped reduce the scale of the new upper floor, offering appropriate separation to the eastern and western boundaries, which when combined with which, which when combined with elements of obscure glazing and obscure, green, uh, obscure screening limit impacts on neighbours. In terms of the area of the proposed property, the area of the proposed ground floor when compared, or the area of the entire property when compared to the gross internal floor area of number 14 Crowsport <coughs> Estate, which measures 276 metres, or 5 Satchel Lane, which measures 200 metres squared, 14A Crowsport Estate as a whole measures less with a gross internal floor area of 193 metres squared. On balance, as per feedback from the conservation area, the proposal is considered to be acceptable as it will not be harmful to any surrounding properties and as a whole enhances rather than detracts from the character of the Crowsport estate and Hamble conservation area more widely. Um, can I just say that? If it's very quick because you, you've yeah. had more than your three minutes already, but if it's very quick. In support of this application, the people that objected had at least twice the time that I have, and normally these these things uh, go along the lines that each each group has five or three minutes to stick to. Not that the objectors can speak for ten minutes, and I can speak for three and a half minutes. No, but you're still wasting your minutes now. So if you make your point, I did say you could make it. Just a point regarding the way that this is um, panned out from your side. Sorry. 
Uh, I was just making a point about the way that you 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 administered the, some of the meetings so far. Well, you said could you make a point, and I said you could if you were quickly. Yeah, was quick. that, that was yeah. my point. I was just highlighting that that I feel that the objectors had more time than I had to proceed, and you were asking me to keep in mind my time limit, highlighting that I had thirty seconds, etc. The, the first person that spoke was told that 30 seconds as well. So have you made all your points? Yes, yes, thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you very much then. Um, I should have asked Andy to come back after um, the first two speakers to um, to see if there was anything that you wanted to come back on the objectors, Andy. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's just worth picking up on a, on a few points for, for clarification purposes. Uh, it's unusual. Normally we'd have plans on the screen as well as me talking. So uh, if there is a particular plan that members wish to see, I can always bring that back up on the screen. But just running through the issues that were raised by uh, residents, uh, the issue about overlooking and amenity. The scheme has been designed to protect the immunity of the properties closest through the use of the um, the parapet walls and, and the screening and also with obscure glazing on the southern side and on the eastern side for the majority of windows. Uh, so that would ensure that there is no overlooking directly from within the buildings or from the roof terraces themselves. Uh, the scale and bulk of the building has been raised as, as a question. Obviously, members, your form, your own opinion on th that itself. Um, however, in terms of the bulk relationship to neighbouring properties, uh, the first floor element, because it is the first floor, which is the noticeable difference uh, compared to what's there at the moment, is set sufficient distance away from neighbouring properties not to cause uh, any undue dominance or visual intrusion uh, from the rear of number 30 uh, that extension is a good 16 to 18 meters from that building uh, and with no clear glazed windows within that area uh, the scale of that building is not considered to cause um, undue harm or impacts on the amenity of number 30. There was reference to the quality places made and 20 metres between buildings. That's actually 20 metres between first floor facing windows, which are clear glazed and it's to protect privacy rather than to ensure that a bulk of a building isn't isn't harmful. Um, there has been some reference to uh, the use of roof terraces, disturbance and noise associated with that and potential overlooking in, in different directions, particularly to the north and to the to the west. However, one of the characteristics of Crowsport is the use of roofs, both on the single storey buildings and some of those which have got two storey elements. And there is a, an accepted and acknowledged overlooking from various properties as properties look down the hill towards the river. Uh, and that's one of the characteristics of, of, of the estates, uh, which is, is seen on, on many of the properties. Uh, there are some buildings within the estate which um, do jar with the Art Deco design. Uh, there's been reference to some pitched roof buildings in there which are uh, original. Uh, and in terms of this particular application site, the, the the glazed conservatory areas, whilst having been there for, for many years, don't form part of the original concept of the Art Deco design. And that's why the Heritage Office has made particular reference to those and, and highlighted their removal as being an improvement on the scheme, uh, on the buildings that we see before us at the moment. And this is a balanced decision that members you'll, you'll, you'll need to strike in terms of the characteristics of Crowsport uh, and whether you feel that the development respects those characteristics, which is the simplicity of design, the use of materials uh, and the cubist approach to it, as well as whether you feel it preserves and enhances the conservation area uh, in terms of the scale of the building. Uh, and I think the views from public vantage points are, are very key in, in forming an opinion on that. As I say, if there's any particular plans you want me to bring back up on the screen, I can, but thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy. Um, we will ask um, when we move out to debate um, whether any members um, want anything. Um, can I thank the um, three speakers this evening um, because this this is all very new to us and it's been great that we can we can keep them public participation going. So thank you for those three speakers. OK, over to members who wants to uh, to start here. Malcolm, please. You're on mute still, Malcolm. That's 
that's it. That's better. Um, reference the um, the new dwelling, the dwelling there, because I, I used to, I know that haze quite well. We were mainly it's the upper first floor, which is the consideration because most of the area on the great lower ground is the same, but they're going to do alterations. The First floor is basically the same, but they're taking away the porch and adding another porch in certain areas. They're taking away a lovely window and bricking it up, which is OK. As far as I'm concerned, that's already been existing. There's minor alterations um, to the upper first floor where the accommodation is. It's similar to number 14, which is down alongside there. If we can have that up Andy, later on. And also, when you go and look at the street scene, you wouldn't know it was a three storey building. It blends in with number 14 as you go down and it's basically the same. So. How can I say this? Yes, it's a, a special area. It's been altered a lot, but it conforms to the entrance as you're going down to Crowsport. The two first two hazes are practically identical and all I'm just saying is that it, it's not a three storey bed, it is already a two storey one with a lower ground on the first floor. We're adding another build on top for accommodation, which is exactly the same as one next door. And I think it's very hard to try to say to refuse planning when it's similar. So I, I'll probably get kicked to pieces about this from the parish and other people, but I think um, like I will propose to permit. But if you look at the street scene, Andy, as you're going down Satchel Lane facing the houses, you'll see what I mean about um, the way the street scene looks, and they look similar as you're going down the hill. So I, I would propose permit. Thank okay. you. Um, I've now lost who's on. Um, do we have a seconder for permit? Yes. Yeah, you're seconded, David. Did you want yeah. to speak now? Yes, I have asked to speak. Yeah, I know, but Malcolm proposed then before before uh, we had a seconder, so I had to make okay. sure it was a seconder. Well, <clears throat> I was going to have a, a quick nip down and look at the site again um, lunchtime today, but uh, just as I got my shoes on to walk out to the bus stop, um, that rain came and I shied off it. But I do know the location well enough to be able to, to talk upon it. <clears throat> um, the area of Crowsport is um, a, certainly a unique development within Hamble itself. It's within the conservation area. And I think most people, uh, certainly on the committee members and staff know that I'm <coughs> like Art Deco architecture myself um, very much. <coughs> the present additions that have been made to the property and, and so on the fact that it was built later than the originals have, have actually not uh, in, in all cases kept the original style particularly well of the of, of the art deco architecture some of the um, <coughs> section to that particularly the uh, stilted um, overhanging bit is is very really out of character and uh, and, and so on so um, the amended alterations uh, to the properties um have taken place over years uh, to a number of properties that are on the estate so there are a large number of them which actually aren't exactly as they were originally built now and have been we've had recent planning applications uh, since i've been on the council um for um amendments to the to the buildings there so uh, i think that one that has to be remembered the enclosed section on stilts, um, which Andy described as alien, um, I think is very ugly at the present time and doesn't reflect well on the uh, Art Deco style. Um, and um, the replacement of the conservatory also um, enables uh, the development to be far more in keeping with the original idea of Art Deco um, architecture. I'm also pleased to see the chimney gone, which is an ugly feature at the present time, though flat roofed Art Deco buildings very often did have a short stubby chimney, not one perhaps as tall as that. 
Um, looking at the ele the north elevation in particular, when Andy showed the, uh, that, I think that sh that in particular is a very attractive and shows the improvements that the proposals make for the building. And as has been said, this is about precedent, one of the things that people have talked about. And I think it needs remind people need reminding that every single planning application we receive must be considered on its own merits, and therefore the topography and uh, the size of plots and so on will be have to be taken into account in each case. And the topography on this side, where 14A is, is different to the other side of, of, of the road and the lower area where some of the properties have in fact got uh, larger larger um, plots with them. Overall, I think that this proposal is in character uh, with the um, Art Deco style, but um, the amendments that have been made have helped to sort out some of the overlooking problems that have been suggested. And I think that um, the uh, overall, it is a, it is a, it is a, a, a judgment that one has to make, but I, I think that I can support this application and I'm happy to second it. Thank you, David. Um, we have Steve wanting to speak. So, Steve, please. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think David's actually hit the nail on the head with this one. Um, I'm not a ward councillor, but I've taken a great interest in the, this design because I, I actually like this style of house very much. And uh, I have referred to them in the past as being slightly Thunderbird-esque, where <laughs> the old uh, puppet show where everything was blocked um, in this style. And I, I've always had a fondness for this type of design. As far as this application is concerned, I have to be honest, I do like it. I like the look of the building. I like the look of the extension. It is subservient to the main building, although alterations are being made in various locations on the site. Uh, the old windows, the bay windows, etc. Yes, they're not really in keeping. And this is almost bringing it back to its traditional form. Um, Probably in the end, the, the reason why I can support this application is purely because of the topo topography, which David has mentioned, in that uh, it does slope down here. And when you actually look at the building from the front door, which I believe is the west elevation, you can't really see the bottom floor, which is actually um, garages and workshops. So the impact is reduced. So for that reason, really, I find it very difficult. Or I would find it very difficult to support objection in this particular instance because I'm not convinced that we would win an appeal because of the topography and the lie of the land and the way they've uh, designed the uh, extension on the top to be subservient to the existing building. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. Adam, did you want to speak on this one? Thank you, Chair. Uh, may I start by uh, congratulating you and thanking you, Chair, on, on running the meeting so well. It's a very new experience for all of us, so uh, thank you and well done. Um, I've read through the report that we've had from Mr Granfield. Uh, the Council is very lucky to have such an experienced and uh, professional officers such as Mr Granfield providing us with these very detailed reports on these applications. I've uh, also considered uh, the uh, comments made by the contributors this evening and we've been very fortunate to have them uh, come forward and make their views known on this application. I take the view that uh, this application should be permitted in accordance with the report from Mr Granfield and my concern is that if we were to refuse it I believe that the council will be very vulnerable on appeal and might end up uh, losing a, a legal case and having to pay large amount of legal costs uh, unnecessarily as well. So I'm very mindful of that particular point as well. So for those reasons, I'm convinced by the contents of uh, the report and I believe the application should be approved. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Jane, did you want to come in at all? 
Um, yes, I actually agree with everybody else. Um, I did at first think it was um, too large for the plot, but the way Andy has written the report, and especially with the 3D graphics, um, it's put my mind at rest. And I too think, as Adam and Steve said, we've got to think about um, appeal as well. Um, so I fully support this. Thank, okay. you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'm obviously the odd one out this evening. Um, I'm not going to be supporting this. Um, I think that uh, it is overpowering on the site that's there. Um, we've, we've had these applications go up in the past where they, they don't look um, that detrimental until you actually see the built form and you think, oh my God, look at the size of that. So um, I think it might be a case of, of, of that for some of the properties that surround it. So I won't be supporting it. Um, but that said, it's been proposed and seconded um, to permit. Andy, was there anything that you needed to come back on at all? No, thank you, Chair. You're muted, Chair. Don't know how that happened. Um, right, so it's been proposed and seconded. Um, I think we'll go over to Laura for a roll call. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, just as a reminder, you needed to have been in the room for the entire at your devices for the entirety of that presentation. And as I could see all your cameras, I can tell that you were all there, so that's fine. But just as a reminder, you need to be voting in good faith. So um, we'll start with Councillor Airy. Oh, you're muted, Councillor. Still muted. Oh, you, you are muted and muted again. Just click it once, David. There you go. Right. OK, vote to permit. Thank you. Councillor Craig. Against. Councillor Cross. Permit. Councillor Holes. Permit. Councillor Manning. Permit. Councillor Rich. Permit. So that's five councillors in favour of the recommendation chair and one against. Thank you very much for that, Laura. Again, thank you, everybody, um, members of public that uh, that came online to talk to us. Um, but that uh, that has per been permitted now. Um, um, sorry, Chair. Councillor Holes has um, just shared his desktop. So bear with me a second while I rescue that. Yeah, I was just about to ask who shared it. <laughs> didn't know I had. Sorry. <laughs> you learned something you new, didn't you? <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, OK, the only thing that we have left is um, the planning appeals for noting. Um, I think, are there any members that have any questions on the planning appeals at all? No, no yeah? questions, and, Chair. Sorry? No, no questions, Chair, but the, the point in the past we've always made um, is we'd like to see on here noted whether it was a delegated decision or an LAC decision and I don't think that's there um, this evening. I haven't got the papers in front of me so, to see. No, I can't see the papers but I can see a note from Helen Devereux. There's an update on planning appeals um, which um, I picked up the other day but like you this uh, this uh, agenda I've got in front of me doesn't have the planning appeals on the bottom of it. Um, Helen, can I ask you just to update us on that one because um, I haven't got the agenda, that part of the agenda. Yes, that's fine. Um, Thank you. Just to say that item 10A on planning appeals, um, the appeal that was lodged has been now been dismissed by the planning inspectorate. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'd forgotten about that one. Um, and I did ask a question on um, the corner of Peewit Hill that um, had lapsed. Um, they, it's a container that needs to be removed. It was extended. I have heard from enforcement that uh, they were going to be writing to him um, yesterday for that to be removed. So that is that one updated as well. OK, so I think that is the end of the meeting. Is there anything that anybody wanted to add at all on any um, anything else at all or on the agenda at all? 
No, no thanks. nothing else it's added. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think for, for a first time um, live, we've all done very well. Yeah. Uh, and it's it, again, it's been absolutely brilliant that we could have had um, members of public joining us. So um, hopefully yeah. it's put uh, members of the public in, in the faith that they can come onto our meetings in the future and be listened to um, and we'll see what they've got to say. But thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Safe. Good. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Well chaired. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.